Kan Bonan. Melang. Abu Sheni. I think we need to practice our 11 official languages. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. Uh, Professor Alex uh, Broadbent, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. Uh, Professor Ilva Rodney Gumede, she is the reason why we are all here. I think let's give her a round of applause. And Dr. Joe Tolwe. When I was growing up, uh, Dr. Tolwe, I used to read your writings. You had a sharp pen. <laughs> um, but I don't read it anymore. You know, uh, we are looking forward to still hearing your views. Of course, um, Dr. Dr. Tolwe used to be our press ombudsman. He has worked for many, many years uh, in the media. He uh, holds uh, two honorary doctorates, one from um, Rhodes University, another one from Vet University. I'm already jealous, uh, Professor Sina. <laughs> Senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this event. It's really a, a great deal of honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to this professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Ilva Rodney Kumede. Of course, this happened under the background of huge changes that are happening in the media. Few year, few weeks back, I read a paper on uh, the fourth industrial revolution in journalism. Of course, uh, Professor Ilva Rodney Gumede was the author of such a paper. <laughs> what is happening is obviously the, the media consumption is different. People are going on to, to Twitter to, to read about the news. The President of the United States almost now uh, communicates primarily on Twitter. And uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Tolwe, Twitter, you have a limitation of how, how much you can write. I think it's 195 words. Characters. characters. Oh, it's characters. You can see I am still in the first industrial revolution. <laughs> <laughs> And obviously, this uh, you know this brings a lot of uh, dynamics to how we train people who write. <coughs> you know, how do you express something that will be expressed in one thousand three hundred words, in uh, words, not characters, in one hundred and ninety-five characters? I also do wish to express warm welcome to Professor Ilva's family and guests. Uh, I cannot see your family. Uh. Oh. <laughs> if you, if, if, if uh, the three of you could just stand up so that you could also be applauded. Because for Ilva to, to be here, I am sure that... Uh, you know, she took some of the times that actually belong to you. <coughs> it is obviously a, a proud and joyful moment for all of us here at the University of Johannesburg and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors, uh, many people think that uh, it came during the the medieval, uh, Middle Ages. It actually comes from the Catholic Church. You know, the Catholics, uh, you know, and I consider myself half Catholic, <laughs> <laughs> so I can be able to speak a little bit uh, 
um, quite authoritatively about uh, uh, Catholicism. Uh, they used to, when you induct uh, somebody to the Catholic Church, it's, uh, it's quite uh, a beautiful ceremony. Adrian, I don't know how your induction into the priesthood was like, you know. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pomp and ceremony. And the reason why we do it so publicly is so that uh, uh, maybe we should also welcome uh, uh, another family member who has just come out. <laughs> Please stand up so that you could also be seen. Please stand up so that you could be seen and be applauded. So this, uh, uh, you know, this ceremony was done so that um, those who with eyes and those with ears uh, could be able to see and hear that uh, a prophet has, has been inducted in a village or a town. And when we talk about a professorship, I don't think it's too far off because uh, the professors are supposed to profess. They are supposed to profess about the future. My brother was telling me that, uh, you know, when you hear these people who were called prophets, they were actually not prophets. It's not literally a prophet. It's really people who were so learned that they were able to see patterns in society, and be able to tell you where society is going. And that is really what uh, Ilva has been doing, and that is what Ilva today is going to be pro proclaimed as. As a prophet who is going to profess to us what will be, going, what will be happening in our media space going forward. What is the meaning, uh, Professor Broadband, what is the meaning of uh, academic freedom? And uh, why is it important? Uh, for me, I think it is important because uh, uh, coming from, uh, from the past where we come from, where our ideas, and by the way, um, I, I, I used to be a citizen of another country, uh, the Republic of, uh, of Venda, you still remember it? <laughs> With its own uh, central bank, it's called the VBS, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So we come from that past, where the difference between what was real and apparent was not, was not clear, you know where you had to go to the em embassy of another, so-called another country, to get a passport of the other country that you are not supposed to be uh, a citizen of. So the ideas of, um, of freedom is very, very important. Freedom and liberty is very important. It's actually the DNA of South Africa that uh, we're trying to build. It's not perfect. But uh, it's something that is worth fighting for. Now, Professor Rodney Gumed, our expectations on what you are going to do for us, for our society, and for the world are actually quite immense. We expect you to continue to be open-minded about ideas, to challenge ideas, but knowing very well that um, ideas can be overthrown when the new truth emerges. That is really what scientific thinking is all about. The fact that when you gather a um, new piece of evidence, that tells you that uh, that thing that you have been saying it's not entirely correct. You are able to change your mind. You know, um, you know I think um, in the trade union movement, Trevor, is 
criticism and self-criticism, isn't it? Very, very important. So, I'm not going to steal uh, Professor Gomez's uh, thunder, but I am actually quite excited uh, to be here this evening, and I am looking forward to listening to you. I have never studied any form of journalism at all, so I'm looking forward to listening to your ideas uh, and, and, and engaging on them. Thank you very much, Nia Wonga. Now, I am going to invite the Executive Dean, Professor Alex Broadbent, to introduce Professor Ilva Rodney Gumede. Uh, thank you very much. My, 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 uh, my job is to read out the CV, which is always uh, um, uh, a little disappointing, since I always have much more to say than uh, is on the CV. Um, but let me limit myself to just one or two remarks. Um, uh, one is that Professor Rob Gumede is uh, one of our most prolific publishers in the faculty, which is uh, great. If I were a, a dean of, say, engineering, I would be able to tell you how many papers you published, but in humanities we're a prenumerate society, we use this numbering system, one, two, many. And she published <laughs> many papers uh, recently. Um, uh, th the second um, is that she's very active uh, within our faculty, and has been ever since I, um, ever since I arrived, um, uh, when I believe she was already here, as I recall. Um, and that's important too, um, in a professor, because um, uh, being a professor is not just about uh, being a citizen of, of the world of ideas, but bringing those ideas to play and to bear upon uh, the world and the institutions in which you're in and th the world outside it. So, um, you know, I, an ivory tower professor is a, an incomplete one. And, um, and my view is that Professor Rod Rod Rodney Gamede is, is, is not that. She's very active. So let me then read out the, uh, uh, the overview. Um, Elva Rodney Grimade joined the University of Johannesburg in the Department of Journalism, Film and Television in January 2009 and was the head of department between 2013 and 17. She holds a, she holds a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, in, in London, as well as an MA degree in politics from the University of Witwatersrand um, and an MA in journalism from Cardiff in the UK. She has an undergraduate degree in law, media and politics from the University of Stockholm in Sweden and also holds a certificate in marketing and business communication from the Institute for International Research in Stockholm. Before moving to South Africa in the late 90s, Ilva taught media, communication studies within the adult, media and communication studies within the adult education system in Sweden. And she also worked for the Swedish public broadcaster and as a freelance journalist and stringer for several Scandinavian media. Among other assignments, she covered the Balkans from 96 to 99, including the International Criminal Tribunal for Forga Yugoslavia and the Rambouillet Peace Talk over Kosovo in Paris in 1999. She's also worked in marketing and PR for two separate internet startups in Sweden. In addition, she's also conducted research and consulted for several government, private and academic institutions in Europe and Southern Africa on issues concerning media and democracy, including the United Nations Development Programme. Swedish National Agency for Higher Education, and the SADC Parliamentary Forum. Ilva is former lecturer in the School of Communication Science at the University of South Africa, and has held fellowships at universities in South Africa and, ab and abroad, including at University of Witwatersrand and the Danish School of Journalism in Denmark. She is actively involved in teaching and, leading and learning development, including broader curriculum development initiatives at institutional, national and international level, most recently through the Teaching Advancement at Universities Fellowship. In 2015, she received the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg's Distinguished Award for Teaching Excellence. She has also served as an ex external examiner to several South African universities, as well as a curriculum reviewer and critical reader for several universities and international organisations, including the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation. Ilva holds a C3 rating from the, from the South African National Research Foundation and is the current president of the South African Communications and Media Association. Her current research includes investigating the future of African media and communication studies, including that of journalism. She has also published on questions related to the broader transformation of higher education in South Africa. 
She's been a member of the University of Johannesburg Senate since October 2013 and served on several Senate committees, including the Senate Academic Freedom Committee, the Senate Committee on the Decolonization of the Curriculum, the Senate Task Team on Assessing Undergraduate Throughput Rates, and most recently, the Senate GES 4.0 Communication Task Team. She has also served on several faculty committees, including the Faculty of Humanities Higher Degrees Committee and the Humanities Teaching and Learning Committee, and presently sits on the Joint Finance, HR and Promotions Committee of the Faculty of Humanities. Ilva is married to Professor William Gumedi, and they have three boys, Lars, Emil, and Misha, who we've already welcomed. Um, and Ilva asked me to uh, add a welcome to her friends, who she regards as her family in South Africa, as well as her family in Cape Town and uh, in Sweden. And it gives me great pleasure, therefore, to invite uh, soon-to-be Professor Rodney Gumedi to address us. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, and I hope that you will be able to hear me, then I, I will project clearly to all of you. And, um, you know, if you were students, which you are not, I would say, please come forward, <laughs> fill up the empty seats in the front, <laughs> so that I don't have to shout. Um, but I hope you will be able to hear me, and that it will be clear enough, and that I will also keep to some of the time constraints that we have. And um, if I look very stiff, it's because I've been told to look towards the camera, not necessarily into the camera, but to um, not move around too much. And normally I run around when I <laughs> present my lectures. <laughs> I skip around the very big classrooms that we have. Anyway, it gives me great pleasure to see you all here tonight. And um, Professor Mavala, thank you. Professor Broadburn, thank you. Dr. Flora, it's a huge uh, honor for me to have you here and to have you also give a brief um, response to my lecture later on. It's, it's, it, it's, it means a lot to me. And to see you, friends, family, colleagues, and you're, you're just too many to say thank you to all of you, but uh, I hope that you know that for me, coming to UJ has been a journey that um, has been incredible. I, don't, I hope that I will never go anywhere else. Um, UJ has provided a home, a platform, and, um, you know, we've had robust debates here, and, um, but it's an environment where I feel comfortable to have those discussions and debates, and for me that's been hugely valuable, and I've been able to grow my career. So the colleagues in, um, in the wider University and Senate, thank you. The colleagues in the faculty, Dean Broadbent, I've thanked. Sad you're here tonight, Professor Metz. You've been hugely instrumental to me in learning the ropes of the academy and, uh, and a compassionate ear when I didn't know what I was doing and tears were flowing many, many times. Uh, so thank you. And my colleagues in the department, Elna and, you know, we've, we've as you say, you know, another one bites the dust. We've pulled the rabbit out of the hat together many times. <coughs> and, and with the help of, of, of Emerentia as well, and some of the colleagues who are not here to, tonight, Michelle and, and, and Nadia and, and Phyllis, and later on Jane, Dumi, you mean so much to me. It's been fantastic. And Lindsay <coughs> and Amy have been, uh, you know, our secretaries in the department as well, which has been fantastic. And then, of course, you know, my, my friends, and when I see, you know, Margaret and Sarah sitting there, Bongi, um, I say, you know, it's, it's fantastic, you know, and, and uh, Bongi, I, I think you, more than anyone, has been the one who's always cheered me on and also stopped me in my tracks when I've been sitting there in front of the laptop. Bongi's been the one who said to me, you know what, you've got to stop now, you're actually not being a friend. And that's, <laughs> been, that's been fantastic. I appreciate it so much, more than I can ever say. And uh, so, thank you, thank you. And, uh, of course, Emil, Lars, Misha, William. Without you, I wouldn't be standing here at all. And particularly William, who put a gun to my head and brought me to South Africa <laughs> all those years ago. <laughs> you know, uh, shame on him. Anyway, so that was, the, the, that was my Oscar speech. Um, um, Alex was ca very kindly texted me earlier and said, please don't do the Oscars, Ilva. <laughs> and, and here we go, you know, yeah, that's it. Anyway, so let's launch into what we're supposed to, to do tonight. And we're supposed to talk about the media. And uh, Professor Mavala said, you know, we hope to hear something about sort of predictions about the future of the media. 
Well, as the old adage go, we can't really know where we're going if we don't know where we're at, and particularly where we have been. And my research on the South African news media has been lodged very much in trying to understand where we've come from and where we find ourselves. So in my presentation tonight, I will revisit some of the debates around the news media in South Africa, hopefully with a view to take a leap forward and look into the future and to see what we can be, what we can do, and uh, what the news media, very importantly, should be doing, and what journalism, what role journalism could take on. Uh, and in doing so, I will try to attempt to situate the South African news media in the post-colonial discourse and answer then some of the questions around the role of journalism and the news media in contemporary South African society. And as we all know, and as Professor Mavala also pointed out earlier, there are numerous challenges that face the contemporary news media, and including journalism then as both a practice and also as an institution, not only in South Africa but worldwide. But I will try to focus on some of the unique challenges that are presented to the news media in the post-colonial context and in a post-colonial society such as South Africa, and particularly then with view to the debates that we have seen post-apartheid uh, and post-1994, and maybe since the beginning of the 1990s, around transformation and later also discussions around uh, decolonization. And in many ways, discussions in South Africa around the news media has focused very much on a more recent history of apartheid and its aberrations in terms of racial transformation and also gender transformation and broader social economic discussions as well. But such discussions have unfortunately often neglected the longer <coughs> historical processes left and legacies left by colonialism, for example. Uh, and those are the debates that, and discussions that I'm hoping to get to. And while the more recent debates then, or recent, if we call them recent, if we talk about post-apartheid uh, debates around transformation, um, have touched upon also diversity of news contents, they have often stopped falling short of actually looking more towards the broader debates. And some of the research that I have done around, for example, where, where South Africa should really be commended. I mean, South Africa is interesting, and I've written about this, is that we are the only transitional justice process through the TRC that actually held institutional hearings into the news media. That's unique to South Africa. And we did, we focused very much on the institution. However, we neglected to actually look at what happens, what happens now, what kind of ethos of the news media and journalism do we want to create to go forwards, for example. And that's what's been neglected. But, but we tried in many ways. And of course, journalism and the news media is such a public institution. Um, I joked with some of my colleagues from Senate yesterday in a meeting that we had around communications that if you say to someone, I'm a journalist, everyone has a comment, eh? Because we all read, we all engage with the news media, and you get lots of questions. Equally, if you say to someone, I'm a teacher, mm -hmm, we all have experiences of sitting in a classroom. Combine the two. You tell them, I'm a teacher of the media. <laughs> you don't want to go there, you know. You have something to discuss for, for ages. But such is the nature of the news media and, of course, the, the, the teaching profession as well. Uh, and that makes it interesting, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm a teacher of the media and, 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 of course, a scholar in the sense that I've constantly learned. Anyway, let's get back into this text so that we can get through it, and I'm going to try to focus on what I've written here because otherwise I'll stray. Anyway, we know that globally the role of the news media is highly debated and in an ever-evolving technological and heavily technologically influenced industry, questions are asked to whether journalism can survive in the digital, uh, with, the, with the digital uh, introductions and technological introductions, and particularly with the rise of social media. Uh, questions are also asked all over, what role can journalism play amid such changes and particularly with regards to its diminished powers or supposedly diminished powers and diminished power as to its public good and its role as a fourth estate. There are other questions such as who is a journalist and what is news that arises out of these debates as well. 
these are not necessarily new debates. They have they have been there with us for a long time. And of course, the news media is one of these industries that's heavily influenced by new media technologies and technologies uh, and societal developments uh, as a whole as well. So these are, you know, the news media has always changed with the times. However, there are particular turning points in time where the news media has taken great leaps forwards. We stand at such a point in time We've always emphasized the role that the Industrial Revolutions have played in the, uh, the first Industrial Revolution, of course, and involvements of the printing press, for example, and such technological leaps and societal uh, developments that has impacted on the news media. But I do think that the fourth Industrial Revolution presents particular opportunities for the news media and journalism in particular, and I hope to, to get to there as well. But firstly then, let's try to dissect where we're at and where we've come uh, from. I think that it's been important, and it is important, to take stock of where we're at at this point in time. We know that we've come out of a history where we've had a news media heavily influenced by its colonial heritage and a colonial press and what that's meant for the functioning and role that the ju uh, journalism and the news media has played in South Africa. I think and I hope we're well aware of that. I hope that we are equally aware of the role that the news media has played in the dismantling of such legacies. We have seen, we have had a very strong tradition in South Africa of an opposition press, an opposition press against the legacies of, of colonialism, but also a press that then fought actively against apartheid and to change the political system uh, of the day. This is a role that the news media has continued to take on and taken into contemporary society as well. We have a very proud history in South Africa of investigative journalism, for example, and I think we should really uh, appreciate and encourage what journalists uh, do, and particularly then um, our investigative journalists. We wouldn't know, for example, much about the f what mismanagement under the former Zuma administration, for example, would it not have been for the news media that we have and the investigations that have been done. And I think when uh, we sometimes criticize the media, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but sometimes when we do so, we might also remember that a lot of things that we know are actually coming out of the news media. We, did, we, we wouldn't know about them if it wasn't as such. So we know that in South Africa, the black uh, anti-colonial as well as the opposition press and alternative press during the years of apartheid have played an absolutely crucial role in the dismantling of the same. And as I say, then, this role has very much been taken over by... Um, the news media that we see today, and particularly investigative journalism in the contemporary society. <laughs> However, whilst we know that the media has, and the news media and journalism in particular, has a role to fulfill, more and more the links between, uh, uh, the links between media and the role that it fulfills in a liberal democracy is being queried. New technology, social media, and um, the sort of glut of information and the rise in new forms of communications have put, put a dent to maybe the role that the media sometimes also have claimed. I think that we take for granted sometimes that the news media has a particular role to fulfill in a liberal democracy. But that is being queried. And I think that the ideas of the news media as a public good and the idea of the media fulfilling, news media fulfilling a particular role in the public sphere is still very much lodged in our ideas of the Habermasian uh, public sphere, which is actually a funny notion. And I sometimes wonder if we don't think about it uh, in a quite a limited way. I think that from a sociological and political uh, point of view, the public sphere has come to entail a lot of different things. From a media perspective, we like, media scholars like to talk about the public sphere as actually being included in a broader sphere, which is the media sphere. And this is actually how Habermas himself explained it. He talked about the media sphere as the bigger concentric circle, 
and the public sphere being just a small part of that circle. I think the sociologists and political scientists often think about it the other way around, that the public sphere includes the media sphere. Uh, but enough about that. I'm just trying to enforce something here that sounds good and, and be. <laughs> anyway, uh, the public sphere, then back to this, and, and, and I've written about it quite recently, and, and um, Professor Milton, who is here, my dear colleague from UNISA, who I forgot to thank, uh, thank at the beginning of, but I do that now, Viola, which has just flown into from Zim as well. Uh, we've written about this together with our colleague in, uh, in the UK, Professor Winston Marno, and queried the links between uh, the, this idea around media and democracy. And there are many injunctions that we can do here. And query what is the role of the news media? What function does it really fulfill? And more importantly then, what role do we want it to fulfill? And what role can it fulfill in terms of, of representing a public? And I think this is important then. So when I said I want to sort of revisit some of the debates around the news media and take stock of where we're at, I think this is the important aspect of it. The media in South Africa hasn't really fulfilled the public service role that we then envision coming out of many sort of lib more liberal normative traditions of the news media in the sense that the public interest in South Africa has been very narrowly defined. It's been defined and based on a very small, often urban, white, quite wealthy elite. Hence, we already see the majority of the South African population was never included in that public interest. Firstly, there was an, uh, an issue of access. Most people, and we know that's still a problem, most people don't have access. Even, even the public service broadcaster doesn't reach out to the majority of the population. So how can we even start talking about the public interest when we're not there? And that's an important aspect of it. Of course, we also know that we've had a very de de uh, uh, media that's been divided. So even the parts of the news media that try to reach out to a broader layer of the population was often very divided in terms of reaching out only to a specific language group based on racial or uh, divides and social economic divides. And even though gone are the days of the sort of Bantustan editions or black editions of the newspapers, we still think about audiences very much in the same way. And it's not only the commercial media or the print media, it's also unfortunately our public service broadcast. I don't see my SBC colleagues here. So I, I, I'll, I'll slate them. Hello. <laughs> 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 I'll slate them. Stefan is not with, you know, these are the Junisa people. They came late. They traveled from <laughs> Pretoria. <laughs> but very much welcome. <laughs> anyway, but the SBC then is still divided. So we know that SBC 1 has been the, uh, uh, often catered for the African languages. And African languages then have been just, you know, thrown into the bigger pot. SBC 2 has catered for an Afrikaans audience mainly, and then SBC 3 has catered for an English-speaking audience. Look at what these different uh, channels do. Once again, I hope that the SBC is not going to, you know, take me off their, their programming henceforth. But the English channels are very sort of, you know, chatty, they're, they're a bit like me. They, hello. They also didn't acknowledge. We have the Swedish ambassador, Mr. Cecilia Julian here. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> All the way from Pretoria as well. Anyway, so um, uh, all protocols observed. Now, now let me get back. In. Let me get back into the to the lecture. Anyway. Um, SBC three English channels, very chatty, entertainment. Uh, the Afrikaans uh, channel, if you're fortunate enough to understand and speak Afrikaans, you have a very, very, very good news media outlet. It's, 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 it's quite an intellectual, it's quite a broad coverage of issues and topics of the day. Uh, channel uh, one has the soapies, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Once again, throw everything into the pot for to cater for the broader African languages and audiences. Hey? And we're unfortunately very much still there. So the question is then, what can we do? Where can we find ourselves? What do we want to do? And I think that once we know that news media content also has a, has a bias often towards the trivial, 
and, and, and often quite racially biased as well. And we know this. We know how the student movement was covered, service delivery uh, uh, coverage. You know, we stay clear of the political, or we err, and even the Marikana massacre of 2012, we err on the safe side and try not to stay clear of politics then that traditionally uh, throughout our apartheid history has been seen as divisive or too, uh, too progressive in one way or the other. Um, anyway, so where then? Where do we want to be? That's where we're at. Where do we want to be? Let me just scroll through the papers here. Let me maybe first, before I get to where we want to be, mention something about what I do as a media scholar and my colleagues. Uh, not only, of course, in media studies or journalism studies, but in the broader humanities and throughout the university. When we talk about the media, because of course it's not only media scholars who talk about the media. Media and communications concerns us all. And, 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 and we mustn't be precious about that. That's fantastic. I mean, we all communicate. And human communications is one of the things that we can hold on to amid great technological advances as well. There's one thing that as much as robots and artificial intelligence, Professor Mavala, can help us and will really assist us in for, for, uh, sort of uh, forging a way for journalism and furnishing a new kind of journalism, uh, what they can't do so far is to provide empathy, and this is something I know that uh, Prof. Sina and I, we've had discussions about this, and that's the amazing thing. Uh, human communications is something where we can reach out, we can try to understand each other and forge something different, and that, that won't go away. So anyway, media scholars, scholars in humanities, wherever we are, we do some analysis of the media, and that's what I've done to come to this point. Hey? I've tried to understand where we're at, what we do, how journalism functions in South Africa. And unfortunately, much of the ideas around forging a new media system or a framework for the media and where we want to be has come out of very liberal normative theorization around the role of the news media and society, often based on case studies emanating in the global north or in North, uh, Northern, uh, uh, north America or Western Europe. And often such studies have neglected then to look towards the global south, and particularly post-colonial societies in the global south. When they've tried to be more inclusive, they've often looked towards Eastern Europe and post-conflict uh, uh, post, um, uh, or transitional societies in Eastern Europe, for example. We sort of kind of, you know, a lot of commonalities, yes. The idea, broadly, is that we've gone from an authoritarian framework into a democratic framework, but that's not enough. It doesn't provide us with enough contextual information about the media system to forge a new one. And of course, we know in our own context that race still divides society. Gender equalities are still with us. And intersections of race, gender, class, for example. How we want to build and forge a new nation and nation building is hugely important to the news media project in, a, in, in our context, for example. So when we talk about these comparative analysis, we need to factor those variables in to our analysis. And so far, that hasn't been done. Unfortunately, post-colonial studies have been completely left out of much of media studies as well. It's almost like media studies have developed parallel to post-colonial studies, unfortunately. And in later years, we've become more inclusive and we've taken heed of post-colonial theories in our studies. However, not yet in comparative media analysis, strangely enough. And I think that needs to happen. So if we are to analyze our media system, we need to take heed of those things. We need to understand the variables that influence our media system, and we also need to understand how post-colonial theory can help us in understanding our media system better. And this provides us, if we can do so, and also look towards the future, a new technology, and what the fourth industrial revolution does present us with as, as an opportunity, is to actually forge maybe even a whole new media system, a new journalism, and a new public sphere. The interesting thing is that when you interview South African journalists, they're well aware of this. It is not so that, but I often hear that, but you said African journalists aren't, you know, they're not clued up, they don't do this, we don't do enough of that. That is absolutely not true. 
South African journalists, whatever you know, we throw at them, are fully aware of the context that they operate in and what needs to be done. It's often hard to do it, though. And they're well aware of that they've neglected parts of the audience. And they, they try to reach out and they ask, so, so how do we do this? How do we forge a new uh, idea of who the public is in the public interest, for example? And how do we cater for audiences previously neglected? And how do we do this amidst then a media sphere and a social media sphere where anyone can be a journalist and anyone, uh, anything almost goes or counts as journalism? Well, I would say that's not true. I think that the role of journalism going in to uh, the future, if you wish, and I just wrote an article where I said something around the lines of future-proofing journalism, it sounds a bit silly, but we are well aware of that the questions are being asked, and my colleague, uh, um, Professor Glenda Daniels from WITS, Glenda, wave a hand, is just involved in a big project around assessing journalism and what journalists ca can do, and I just read it today, Glenda, because you sent it to me. Uh, and, and, you know, how can journalism survive? How can we thrive? What can journalism be? And I think here's the thing. If we are going to reach out to new audiences and forge a new idea of what the public, who the public is in this public interest and create some kind of public sphere where we can have uh, some kind of content that benefits us as citizens and, and the society that we live in, we have to harness the potentials of new technology. I would say not everyone can be a journalist. Not everything is journalism or news. If we can furnish a public sphere that is inclusive in the sense that we can provide access to new media, to a broader layer of the audience, which should be easier and cheaper than the sort of more traditional news media, then we've come a long way. But it's still very dependent on providing access. If we can then furnish a journalist, uh, a journalism and a news and an idea of news that harness technology for doing proper research, in-depth research, then we can have an in-depth co coverage. Then not everything can be journalism or not every media platform can count as news or journalism. But we can have a core that is. This idea then of journalism and going into the future I think that we can all agree that we need to open up the public sphere. If we are to create a public sphere, we need to open it up to a broader layer of the population and make sure that everyone's included. With cheaper technology, I think we can do so. I think also that we can have a different conversation about what news is. And news then should mean, and journalism should mean something that is qualitative and that also talks to societal debates. Not every platform can count as journalism. So maybe it is so that we have to discard thinking about, you know, the car crashians, boys. The car crashians aren't funny. <laughs> the, uh, the car cra do you know the car crashians? The Kardashians, yeah? The car crashians. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's not that, you know, that's not news, that's not journalism. It might be on TV, there might be the news, but it's not, you know. We need to rethink what we do. We need to become serious. We need to do what my good friend Sarah Carter does, you know, for CBS, 60 Minutes shows, in-depth journalism and hard-hitting journalism. That's what we need to do. Now she's blushing, she's going to kill me <laughs> afterwards. And, um, and, and things that matter, and mat and, but also things then that matter to a lot of people. And social media has that function. It can actually reach out. And what it provides for is this idea of participation and actually uh, co-creation, which is hugely important. If we're going to be serious about the language debate and the decolonization debate, we need to make sure that people can actually contribute and feed back into the news media. I cannot do so. I can say ni awonga, yes but that's the extent <coughs> of my African language skills. I have some others as well, but I'm not going to disclose them to you right now, <laughs> maybe later. But we need to make sure that audiences participate and that they feed in and become co-creators. We talk about this as, as, as academics. We know this because this is, what, this is what we're trying to do in our classrooms. We're trying to let our students become co-creators uh, co of a, a meaningful uh, learning project as well, but we can do so in the news media as well. 
and then harness then the technology for that. And as I said, as journalists, we can also use it for research and proper research and actually forge global uh, networks of working together. I mean, one of the most interesting things, I think, in later years that we've seen coming out of the news media has been things like the WikiLeaks and Panama Papers, for example. It's completely changed journalism, and it's completely changed, I think, how we look at information in the public, public realm and what we, can, what we can manage and what we can achieve by it. And I think that's, that's hugely valuable and actually amazing. There's another thing that we can do, and this comes back to this co-creation, and that is we can actually use journalism for telling stories. This is not that we should become storytellers in that sense of, you know, often the criticism against the news media is, but you just tell stories, you know, what's, what's the truth in there? Well, we need to be truthful, but we need to use our skills to tell stories in a compelling way. And we need, once again, to bring the audiences in, the audience that has the language skills to communicate to audiences in South Africa, for example, to tell stories, and to tell stories that are valuable to the communities that we form part of. And I think that's something that's particularly interesting. And it's something that I didn't say in the paper that you all, that I've strayed from it, but that you all have in front of you. It's this idea that the public interest, not only has it been narrowly defined in terms of that huge parts of the audience has been excluded, it has also been very narrow because it has not understood that the public interest is not necessarily something that goes, is national and has to be, me, me, be the same and mean the same for everyone. And I think that's, that's also something that's come out of later research is this, that, you know, there are a lot of different public interests and a lot of different public spheres. And Karina, I can see you nodding because this is what you work on for social media, this idea of a lot of different publics, hey, and how we capture them and how we get there. And I think that's, that's, that's hugely important. So I think that's, that's where we're at. And I think if we're going to talk about the news media that is relevant and that can contribute to transformation of society and the decolonization of our society, we need to look at it as that. We need a news media that actually talks to a lot of different interests but still captures all of us a bigger audience. But those audiences can be niched and divided, and for social media we have the capacity to do so. For us as journalists, we need to understand that we talk to different audiences and niche our me messages as well. But we also don't have to be everything for everyone. Use the technology, do the in-depth investigations that matter sometimes for the broader audience, but sometimes for the smaller audience, and also get the audience then involved, where I don't have the skills, whether those are language skills or other skills, to talk to issues. My audience can do so, and that's important to remember. I think that if we are to look at our society and looking into the future, where we're we heading and where we're we going, I think that we will see that it's not going to be so, that we're only going to have a journalism or a news media that is technology driven or driven by, by artificial intelligence or the, the, the journalism of robotics. Those are still going to be skills that we can, and technology, that we can be masters of and use to our advantage. And use, as I say, our capabilities of, for human, for being human, having empathy, and this idea of human communications to furnish a media sphere that is more empathetic and that reaches out and that captures a broad audience, whether those are small or niche or not. I think I'll rest it there. Mia Bona, Kella Walker, Bye Danzi, Tatienda. I'm now going to welcome Dr. Jo Tlolo from um, to the podium to give a brief uh, brief response to all the various things that I said. So please do give him a warm round of applause. <laughs> Professor Maruala. Prof. 
Professor Alex Broadbent Ilva Professor Rodney Kumete I could I could start with cliches. It's very possible. And I'd be saying I'm privileged and honored <laughs> <laughs> to respond to your inaugural lecture. But the truth is that it was a disturbing one. So disturbing that I hope it will shake us out of our sleepwalking. I think the last paragraph in your lecture said, we need to forge a new media system informed by research emanating both from tools let's try that again we need to forge a new media system informed by research emanating from tools and models that accurately measure what they are meant to measure. Only then can we, earnest, can, can we in earnest start looking towards new models for the news media and the practice of journalism. Models and practice fit for the context that it serves, whether from the vintage point of culture, politics, socio-economic uh, factors, geographical location, and or technological advance and developments. And as we are talking about the tools and models that accurately measure what they are meant to measure, my tummy started churning. The specimens on our laboratory counter, the specimens we are supposed to be measuring, are mutating, stretching in some parts, and shrinking in others as we try to measure them. And worst of all, the lab counter, that's the context, is also changing as we try to measure. So it is in this very disturbed world and a searching South Africa that you propose that we search for new models for the news media and the practice of journalism. As you spoke, we are asking tough questions about the models we have around freedom of expression, democracy, the role of the media today, the havoc caused by technology, 
And fundamentally, you're asking questions about the role of the media in all this. And as you were asking those questions, I realized that we have been working in silos. I'm from the newsroom, and most of you here are from academia. We are trying to find common solutions the way the proverbial blind men tried to fathom what an, en an elephant is. The media houses are bleeding. The old model is crumbling. The advertising cake, what used to be the pillar that supported them through the ages, has been crushed into dust. And most of it is going to things like Google, Facebook, etc. As a result, there are fewer journalists in the newsroom. Shareholders are scratching their heads to find a return on investment. The marketing departments of publications are trying to look for niche audiences that can afford to sustain the publications. While we are in this mess, the politicians and society in general are asking questions about the role of the media and transformation within the media and in society. And we journalists continue to delude ourselves, saying, we are serving society. We will proudly point to the hashtag Gupta Leaks and to what happened to Zuma. Now, for the media, these are life and death issues. The answers to this will tell me whether my son will have a plate of food tonight. Now, academia is also asking the same questions, but from a different perspective. The perspective, Professor, you just enunciated here. My takeaway from tonight is quite simple. Hashtag walls between us must fall. <laughs> and this is important for our journalism, for our media for our democracy, and for our world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilva. When you just, you mentioned artificial intelligence, that was when I realized that you have nailed this in Ogrenet. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Dr. Tolwe, it was quite, uh, you educated us in anatomy. And I was thinking about a specimen on top of a table. And I was wondering what specimen was that one. Uh, but I think it is actually quite important uh, that we, we move forward. I don't think um, the direction of time is going to go backward. Uh, we, have to, we have to become part of the new media that is emerging. Trevor, you still remember, forward ever, backward never. never. Thank you very much. I think let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> so I am going to request the executive dean, Professor Alex Broadbent, and Ilva, and Professor Rodney Gumede, to come forward so that we can we can symbolically. Can be given 